Okay. Well, we'll, we'll get started. I think uh, folks are going to be wandering in. So here's the standard uh, course progress. We're going to be talking about eruptive emissions today. Um, and before we get into very deep into these, I'm going to try and give you a little bit of a motivation talk about why we would care about this in the form of part of the presentation that I made at uh, the American Meteorological Society yesterday. Uh, and just to give you the pictorial view of where we are, we'll, we're still worrying about what the sun is up to and how, after we have made the magnetic field configurations in this very active star, um, what kinds of things can happen. It looks like it's going to be stable, but in fact there are uh, times when the active regions may destabilize, and if they do, then they have a whole gamut of things that they can produce in terms of eruptive emissions. They can produce flares, coronal mass ejections, solar energetic particles, and radio bursts. And we'll talk about at least three out of, well, no, we'll end up talking about all four today. Um, just a view of, this is, I think this is the sun from actually two days ago. Uh, this may have been over the, the weekend. This very large open region uh, is uh, now migrated off. It's moving about 13 degrees per day. And I just checked the solar wind data, and in fact, we're seeing the leading edge of this. Um, it arrived at the L1 monitor about five hours ago. So, uh, and I noticed that the magnetic activity index has gone up a notch, so it's actually responding. And then, uh, not shown on here, I think it was act this region here that's starting to appear is actually this region over here. It's rotating into view. So we're looking at this in the, in the visible continuum as far as spacecraft instrumentation, as your eyes wouldn't see it exactly like that. And then we're looking at this in three bands of extreme ultraviolet uh, energy, plus we've got a magnetic field model uh, sitting on top of that. Question. Uh-huh. So just to clarify, in this, this is the whole magnetic field, right? Is this the whole magnetic field? No. A hole in it. A right. hole in it. It is a region of magnetic field that has a single polarity, and I don't know which polarity this oh, is. Right. Now, so there's not an absence of magnetic field, but it extends so far out into the heliosphere that we can't find the other end of it. So we call it a coronal hole. The hole is actually in the emission spectrum. Because the um, gases are not confined by closed fields, they're free to flow out along the magnetic field line. And they, as they do, they ex kind of expand and cool. And so in this emission, these emission bands, it looks dark. OK. And those gases are what's hitting Earth now. Yes. Yes. OK. All right. Uh, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we are, and as I promised, I'm going to give you a why should we care version of this. And then we'll just come back to this and get as far along as we as we can. So I'm going to hop out of this. This is not, what I'm hopping to is not in your, uh, on D2L yet, although I can put it there. And let's see, file, open, recent, and we are going to go to my AMS presentation from yesterday. <coughs> and we'll bring that up. And of course we're not where we need to be. So, yesterday I was talking to a group of meteorologists and space physicists about a storm that occurred before all of you were born and I was in seventh grade. But it is an event whose impacts were so severe that it nearly changed everything we know about society. And you go, oh, how could something like that happen? Well, let me give you a little bit of context. It occurred in what we call the Cold War. I think a number of you might have been born probably after the Cold War as we know it ended. Uh, but it was, it was a war that developed without a lot of shots being fired immediately after World War II, and it went all the way to about 1991, kind of bridging over into 1992. 
um, when, uh, when essentially the Iron Curtain came down. So I got to give the talk, but the story is actually sort of uh, made by these four individuals who are all retired Air Force. Um, and Lee Schneider was actually the duty forecaster at Cheyenne Mountain Complex uh, when this event happened. Um, all of the rest of us, including <coughs> myself and Trey Cade, have worked in Cheyenne Mountain Complex, so I have a little sense of how the, <coughs> some of the chaos associated with this event might have occurred. Notice that in terms of solar cycles, so you know that the sun cycles, we're right here at the very beginning of what was solar cycle 20. So people who had experience in what the sun could do in solar cycle 19, which was the largest event that we've had in the space age, had kind of moved on from the positions that they would have occupied. And so it's, it's a fresh mindset. However, we were coming into the space age at the time, and Department of Defense decided that they needed somebody that, whose button they could push that says, well, you know, we need to know about the space environment and what can happen. And so a few months before this event occurred, they had actually established a solar forecasting unit <coughs> Um, that was in parallel with the terrestrial forecasting unit in Cheyenne Mountain Complex. Lee Snyder, as I said, was the guy on duty at the time. So I want to tell you about a radio burst, which is not something we've spent a lot of time on in this class, and the associated mass ejection could have such an influence that it might be of historical proportions. So I want to tell you a little bit about the radio domain at the time, and then I'll just highlight a couple of, of things that happened here. The long-term impact of this is that we basically developed a space environment support system within Department of Defense, and that became largely the root of what we now call space weather in the civilian world. So what the heck happened? Well, we had sunspots. And this was a very large group of sunspots. And we had in this region of sunspots actually mixed polarity inside of the same sunspot. Very unusual, very intense magnetic field gradients. You know when magnetic fields get intense and they get kinked up, they're going to become unstable. Well, they did. And so we did not have magnetographs or anything like that, nothing like I, what I just showed you. We had a group at, Na at a National Solar Observatory in Sunspot, New Mexico, and they worked for the Air Force in addition to their civilian jobs, and they took pictures of the sun in hydrogen alpha. So they, it's a visible portion, 653.6 nanometers. And here are some of those filaments that I talked about in the tape class last time. Yes, somebody's helping me with a little diagram too. So here are some of those filaments. This region right here is what we want to focus on. So I blow it up, and this is what it looked like in this region down here in H alpha before the event takes place. Now we see the flare down here starting to occur. It's, it looks like it has two little regions. We'll come back to why that would have. And then in only a few minutes, it's blown out to essentially encompass the entire sun. Now we um, had mostly were looking at ground-based observations at that time. So we had the visible and we had the radio. I'll bring the radio up in a moment, but I want to tell you that just a few months before we had launched, maybe a year before, we had launched Explorer 1, and James Van Allen of the Van Allen belts actually had an X-ray detector on that spacecraft, and he was able to determine uh, and I will show you the results here, that that flare was actually what we would call an X-ray X6 flare, which, so you've already, you've looked at the X1s for your homework, so, you know, this was almost an order of magnitude larger. Significant energy coming out in the extreme ultraviolet. It was also observed in white light. Now you say, well, wait a minute, you've already told me it was in white light. This is in what I'll call red light. This is in... Um, you know, that specific wave band, what was happening is the event was so intense that the electrons from the flare region were being driven down into the solar atmosphere and creating light across the entire visible continuum. That's what we mean by white light. That is a big deal. Okay. And then the radio frequency interference. <clears throat> 
it goes up by three orders of magnitude beyond anything that we had ever seen at the time. Why would I tell you that? Because in the midst of the Cold War, what we were doing was, you know, we had the Eastern Bloc and the Western Bloc. We were the Western Bloc. And our version of, you know, the war as it, w a war as it would develop out of the Cold War is that the Eastern Bloc would be sending either missiles or aircraft, nuclear laden, across the pole to attack us. We had our own capabilities for, for response, and, and of course the other side thought for doing exactly that. So early on, we had developed all of these radar lines, but by the early mid-1960s, we had three big radars. They operated at 440 megahertz, and they just constantly scanned the polar skies. Ten days before this event, we had gone through and finished a major upgrade that had been years in the making. Nothing, absolutely nothing, could get past that, right? Keep that in mind. Okay, so um, one of the issues that Hay had tried to deal with was this problem with radio frequency interference. I'll also mention that radio communication were needed to uh, maintain contact with the aircraft if you were going to launch them. Uh, and we did have aircraft in the air with nuclear weapons at all times during that time. So there was always somebody flying around out there with nuclear weapons. Here's the cone, a cartoon of a cone of one of those radars. And this is what it's supposed to see. It pierces one cone, so incoming, and then it pierces another. And then with that, you can get a, a sense of the motion and you know, track the thing. Down here is a picture of some SAC air base. I don't know which one. Here's a bunch of aircraft lined up here. Uh, and then here are the ones in little kind of Christmas tree patterns that would be ready to go out to the ends of the runway and, and take off if need be. Okay, so we've got that. These guys sitting up there watching, and all of a sudden, pure noise into those radars. This is a great burst that came out in the 23 May 1967 flare out of that same region that I showed you, the white light and x-ray. We were used to seeing at six, dramatic, 606 megahertz, which is a, we measured at five different uh, frequency ranges at Sagamore Hill on the East Coast. Uh, this is about a GPS, although we didn't have GPS at the time. That's about a GPS frequency. 606 megahertz, so that's pretty close to 440 <coughs> megahertz. The value that we should have seen was about 40 solar flux units, 373,000 solar flux units at the peak of this. Well, but we have our radars ready, right? We fixed them. There's nothing that could get into them except radars have... The forward beam, the side beams, side lobes, back lobes. We had not filtered the back lobes. We had no idea that the sun could produce that level of radio flux. And so some of those radars were positioned on May in the polar cap region such that they were looking at the setting sun, seeing 373,000 solar flux units or more into their back lobes. Nothing like that had ever seen, not anticipated. I argue that the shapes of these flares in the radio is such that if we were to look at 440, the value is actually larger. It's probably over 400,000. One time since then, we've seen the sun put out a million solar flux units in GPS frequency, which is a... Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so what was the, what was the thought? Uh, all of a sudden, all of this noise floods the um, Strategic Air Command and Cheyenne Mountain Complex warning systems, and the, the result is we think we're being jammed. At that time, full-scale jamming of, of our big surveillance systems on both sides was viewed as an act of war. So now, now we're in pretty dicey situation. So we've got the detection system jammed. Some of the alert air crews are told to prepare to respond. So off they go, sitting there, not just sit in their aircraft, but actually taxi them out <coughs> to the ends of the runway. You know, that's one level from taking off, and you just didn't launch aircraft with nuclear weapons on a whim. It was a big, big deal to have 
some fraction of the force sitting out there just waiting. And the other issue that goes with this, we, we go, what, you know, it's pretty big. Could we be jammed? Did somebody, did somebody reveal all to the other side and they've gotten into our system and they're actually messing with it? You know, this is so broad, so big. No clear answers, except we've got this one solar forecaster uh, who was trained here at CU. CU uh, APS department had a different name at that time, but they were basically the primary trainers for the Air Force, one of the primary training sites. So we had folks down there who had gotten their training uh, here and a couple of other places, and they're going, oh, oh, wait a minute. We know, we have already seen from the NSO down at Sac Peak that there's something going on with the sun. It is possible. It is possible that this is not an act of war. It's simply the sun being mischievous. So that information got into the command authority lines pretty much just in time. If those aircraft had launched, the radio communication situation was so bad, it's not clear that we could have pulled them back. So there we have it. Situation did slowly improved in terms of that because the radio burst died off. But what also comes with these <coughs> massive solar flares are coronal mass ejections that get loose at supersonic speeds into the interplanetary medium and they start accelerating particles. You have calculated on problem six how fast some of those particles can move. And sure enough, by late on the 23rd, those particles are starting to arrive. The measurements here were mostly being made by polar aircraft. Amazingly enough, we launched a major aircraft system into this radiation storm. We would never do that today. We just didn't know. We, off it goes, it worked perfectly. And so we actually have a record of the 10 MeV, the 30 MeV, and the 60 MeV electrons for that event. This was a pretty major solar radiation event. If we had had astronauts on orbit at the time, we would have told them to take <coughs> cover in their sleeping quarters. This was ugly. And it stayed ugly for a week. And not only is it ugly to somebody out in space, but those particles scream into the upper atmosphere, uh, change the radio propagation characteristics of the upper atmosphere and the polar regions. And so now you've got essentially another um, problem in looking across the pole. You, your radio communications are just a wreck. And they maintain at minor level for, for well over a week. You go, well, OK, you know, everybody kind of knows it's a, it's a problem event. Well, just everybody will stand down. But there's more. We used those radars not only to look and see what was coming in, but we used them to track uh, things in orbit. And so NORAD at the time had a tasking to keep track of the relatively, by these days, meager um, uh, amount of things in orbit. But because, when the energy finally did arrive in terms of the coronal mass ejection, the number of things that we were tracking at that time Let's see here, 1967 would have been about 2,000. And apparently we lost track of about half of them. Now, how are we going to reacquire them? Well, observers, Nunbaker cameras, really fancy cameras, all kinds of things. Or you can use your radars, but your radars in the polar cap are not working very well. So it took a very long time to try and figure out where things were. And furthermore, this was, get, now it's getting into the realm of the kind of work I do, a major disruption. There was somebody out there with Nunbaker cameras looking for spacecraft at all altitudes. This was Hakia. Some of you might recognize that name if you've done any kind of orbit analysis. Uh, he's the person who basically created the the really fundamental um, 
system for forecasting satellite drag, what he was able to determine from his measurements is that the entire atmosphere suddenly saw at orbit altitudes a 500 degree temperature spike and then whoom, it crashed. Very rare that the temperatures actually crash like that. Usually they have a nice long decay. It turns out that this event was so strong that it changed the chemistry of the upper atmosphere and created a chemical in copious amounts that actually overcools the atmosphere. And that is the kind of work that I'm doing. I just had a paper accepted last Sunday on these types of events. How can things go so horribly wrong? You know it's going to heat up, but why does it crash and actually end up colder than when it started. That's the sign of a very bad storm. Okay, so to sum up, the BMU's radars uh, were jammed at the, at the get-go and then later they couldn't be used for the satellite tracking because the polar caps were just filled with particles that were changing the radio propagation. This is a great storm that has basically been hiding in plain sight but because we did not know the story about the radio um, bursts and the, and the response to that, because that was classified until, well, we're at 50 years now, so we can talk about it. Um, so we didn't really know anything about this. I was able to find, by digging into the literature, about 50 articles that have been published in the last 40 to 50 years that describe various pieces of this storm, but it wasn't until we published this in this summer that we were actually able to see the really the big picture of how important this storm was. And as I mentioned, the Department of Defense took this to heart. We had started with space environment support system people in the 1960s, once manned space flight and our understanding of intercontinental ballistic trajectory started to form up. And we said, oh, we need to know something about the space environment. Uh, somehow my operations at, well, in 1966 is when we started um, forecasting out of Cheyenne Mountain. Here's the May 67 event. Now we've got this delta in the number of people involved, so it looks like it goes up by about 30. So it practically doubled overnight. And then by the time 1979 comes along, we've got the ionosphere, the magnetosphere, and all of these other spheres that I've basically uh, told you about. And so we're trying to figure out what's uh, what's going on there. So, to summarize, this was a great solar radio burst, the likes of which we have seen once since then. Um, it appeared to be an act of war, but fortunately we had people in Cheyenne Mountain, some of them trained here at CU, who could tell command authorities that maybe not. It still pretty much rattled and tested our system for a whole series of days because we know these emissions travel at different times, you know, take different amounts of time to get here. And so for a full week, we were in a fairly compromised position. It ultimately ended up changing the way Department of Defense and then anybody who supports Department of Defense, which is a large fraction of groups of people who work here, uh, consider the space environment. So if you want to read more, uh, the paper is here. It is also freely downloadable, and I will put a link to the freely downloadable version um, up on, in course notes so that, you can, so that you can see that. Okay, so that's the motivation, 20 minutes or so, of why we would care about the stuff that now we're going to get into and, you know, it'll become a kind of a normal uh, class lecture. But um, questions about that? It's kind of like, whoa, yeah. Uh, this goes back a couple slides, but what do we do to look at a sunspot to know its polarity? What do we um, We have something called a, uh, let's go back, you know, we, we actually have something called a, um, a magnetograph. Uh, Okay, um, and so um, it turns out that uh, regions that have 
um, intense magnetic field, um, we, we know that particles spin around that field. And if the field um, is oppositely directed, the particles will spin the other way. So essentially what, we are, what will happen is because of, uh, because of the way those particles are spinning, and they're electrons basically, if they're in one orientation, they have a slightly higher frequency than the main um, uh, line coming out, uh, emission line coming out. And if the, if the magnetic field is oriented the other way, there, uh, the uh, frequency of the light is a little bit smaller. It's called Zeeman splitting. And basically what we are seeing is an individual emission line gets spread out and split out just a little bit. And we can take advantage of that and uh, use that to say, are we in an inward pointing field or an outward pointing field? That's a great question. Maybe I'll try and um, bring something into class next time, show you how that works. But it, it's basically what we're up to. And so that, that technology existed well back into the 1960s. I'll point out the name Macintosh here. Pat Macintosh lived here in Boulder. He was one of the people who actually observed the white light flare from just across the street. Uh, he was on his lunch break and just loved to watch um, watch the sun. He has created an archive that goes from about 1964 to uh, 1990 something or other. Um, I should know that because I'm going to be involved in helping to, to resurrect that. It's all paper copy. So we have an NS, we royally have an NSF grant to actually digitize that, colorize it, and put it into a, uh, the, a uh, scheme where we can go from here to here, looking at the maps that he created religiously um, every day or every few days. He passed away in October of last year. I ex just accepted his, his um, obituary. Um, uh, he created the, um, the Macintosh sunspot classification, so within Within these dot just pointing north and south, he has all kinds of, uh, you know, ways of classifying things. So he was actually sort of a founding father of what I'll call space weather. Um, and, uh, yeah, so his work was just absolutely key and, and continued on. So I'll be volunteering to help get those things digitized so that we maintain his record. Other questions? Okay, I've told you a tall tale. Let's, uh, let's put that one away. Goodbye. And come back to tales that aren't quite as tall, perhaps, but hopefully I'm going to get down to the root of this. So what I told you was that we had flares that were with radio bursts. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, in a cartoon form, why these things go hand in hand. Uh, we don't always get coronal mass ejections with flares. We don't always get solar energetic particles with flares. We can have coronal mass ejections or flares without CMEs, CMEs without flares. And so you go, huh. All hope is lost. But we have some ways of categorizing. And what we know about these really big events is that they're probably going to throw everything at us that, that the sun can. And so we pay attention to the extreme events. So here's the definitions. Um, we've got a sudden rapid and an intense variation in electromagnetic energy, usually measured under current circumstances in the X-ray and gamma ray portions of the emission, but we can look at you know, whatever detector we like to build. The, we, the sun also frequently ejects magnetized material out into interplanetary space, sometime directed at us. Um, solar energetic particles can come with either of these. They may come directly from the flare site, or they may come as the CME pushes out into interplanetary space making a changing magnetic field, which charged particles will see as an electric field. And so they are then uh, accelerated by the electric fields. 
And then we have these kind of smaller things, much more repetitive and forecastable, called coronal hulls with the high-speed streams flowing out. To get a picture of these, um, most of the solar disturbances that we think about come from magnetic field reconfiguration in the closed field regions. The solar magnetic field configuration that leads to coronal holes, I'll put that off on the side. That's more of a medium range, uh, medium level of disturbance. So I'm expecting over the next 24 to 48 hours, we'll have some medium disturbances in the geospace environment. What can this reconfiguration do? It will almost certainly produce some kind of an enhancement in electromagnetic uh, radiation. That's called a flare, x-rays, and radio bursts, and everything in between, but the energy changes, the big you know, orders of magnitude energy changes are in these two bands out here. We may put out some very short-lived particle events, or if this lumbering coronal mass ejection is heading towards us, then the enhancements in the particles uh, from the shock in front of it may create some pretty long-lived events that make uh, folks who are trying to communicate in the polar cap pretty miserable. So <clears throat> showed you this wiring diagram. So what does this really mean? So let's go for a cartoon. In a couple of the previous lessons, we've noted that the bubbling up all the way from down in the tachocline, it can take months to years for one of these bubbles to reach to the surface. We'll pierce the surface as emerging flux, and we've got a region here for the cartoonist decided that the dark would be the out and the white would be the in. Usually we do that different, but either way. Uh, and so we have these loops of magnetic field. And if they could just sit there like that, they would be perfectly happy and never erupt. But we know that there's all of this granulation, turbulence, constant motion going on in the, in the photosphere. And what that does is it tends to braid up these magnetic field lines and twist them up. And when they get braided and twisted, then they contain a lot of energy that they're ultimately going to release. So we didn't do the braiding and twisting here. We're just trying to do in cartoon view, give you a sense of what it looks like. But if differential rotation starts to move these spots relative to each other, you're going to bring oppositely directed magnetic field in contact. And if you do that, well, that's a vector field. And, and vectors will you know, come together and basically annihilate. And so what happens is you reduce the energy content here, but energy has to be conserved. And so that means the energy goes somewhere else. So it's going to go into accelerating particles up and down the field lines, a lot of particles going down. And it's also going to allow us, the system to kind of pinch off a portion of the magnetic field and send it flowing out into interplanetary space at sometimes very high speeds. If the speed is high enough, then a shock wave develops. As that shock wave propagates through the still relatively dense part of the atmosphere that we call the solar corona, you're going to be essentially causing the plasma there to oscillate depending on what the density of the plasma is, it'll oscillate at different frequencies, and you'll get radio emission that's associated with that F10.7 index. In the meantime, you've got these energetic particles being driven down into the dense solar atmosphere, and they are, and some of them have enough energy to actually um, create nuclear interactions. It's just why you see the gamma rays. Uh, they're taking electrons off of anything that might be neutral down there. Um, and even the smallish amount of, uh, you know, heavy atoms uh, lose electrons. And as a result, when some of those electrons come back and de-excite, you're going to get hard x-rays, um, H-alpha light and white light. So that's kind of the cartoon view, and it's a view that we'll take with us. There are some variations on the theme on this theme. There are times when this pinch-off occurs 
And it's simply because for a variety of reasons, the field destabilizes, but it may not have a large component in this reconnection. And if it doesn't, we still can blow something out into space, but we may not get a flare signature. That's why we have a situation where some um, coronal mag uh, CMEs come at us, but without flare signatures. Very frustrating to the forecasters at Space Weather Prediction Center. I was over talking with them last week, and these stealth events just make them crazy because there's no excuse. There's no warning. They just happen. We're in a part of the solar cycle where some of these are just happening. So you have to constantly be looking at H-alpha light to see if anything like a filament has disappeared because if it's gotten loose, it's roaming out there and you don't know how fast it's coming. Usually they're a little slower than the most energetic events that we see here. What is the yellow region? What is this yellow region? This is a region called um, the reconnection region. So this is where the energy that is, um, uh, it, it's, it's the region where these field lines have come together they're oppositely directed, and what this is trying to show is that there's still energy there, so that's kind of our energy reservoir that's going to drive everything else. Yeah. So is that yellow region in, in sort of in the form of charged particles who kind of ended up kind of stationary-ish because their magnetic fields canceled out? Well, they're not, they're not stationary because they're given so much thermal energy that they're going to start moving around. But what happens in this, so this yellow region is kind of a, huh, what's going on region. It represents the energy reservoir that can thermalize the plasma. So, plasma. so we give the plasma essentially higher temperatures without a lot of direction. So all of a sudden the gas goes from being a million to maybe six million degrees in terms of a thermal uh, plasma. And then it's also the reservoir for accelerating particles up and down the field lines. Uh, so those are going to be uh, maybe tens of keV electrons. A typical electron energy in here might be one keV, so a thousand electron volts. But when we see these flares, like the ones I showed you for the May 67 event, it means that copious amounts of 50 to 100 keV electrons have been accelerated down to strip whatever is in the lower atmosphere of their electrons. So we've got directed particles, we've got thermal particles, and then we've got kinetic energy of this whole mass of things that are gonna go flowing out. Now you might wonder, well, are there any rules for how much energy gets deposited where? It turns out that rule of thumb is half of the, if there is a mass ejection, half of the energy goes out here with the big blob of cool plasma magnetized, and about half of the energy ends up in the thermal and, and um, accelerated electron regime. So about half goes into flares or the components of flares and about half goes into this. Now if you want a little bit finer, sometimes these, these events, because they're accelerating these particles out, some of the energy that was in that, in this big magnetized blob, uh, ends up given to those particles, maybe about 10%. So that it gives you some kind of a sense. So you might, you might call it maybe 45%, 45%, and then 10% if you do, in fact, have something that's so energetic that it's going to create an energetic particle. Um, oh, yeah. So here's the color diagrams. So what we're going to be concerned about is the 45% of the energy that goes here, 45% of the energy goes here, and then... Uh, or 10 percent someplace else. Uh, and I think on one of your homework problems I've told you about how much energy is in this little reservoir right here. What did I say? It was 10 to the 27th cubic centimeters. I think was the uh, 10 to the 27th, 10 to the 28th 
cubic centimeters. So that's the size, which is bigger than the Earth, by the way, if you, you know, convert it. And so that's an Earth-sized container of, inner, of lots of energy. And you can figure out the energy density. I ask you to do that, no problem. OK. So to the solar flares for a bit. We see, that, we see them in x-ray. Rarely do we see them in white light. If we see them in white light, whoa, that's a big deal. Uh, we, we get maybe a couple, a few dozens of solar cycle that we can actually see in white light. But our x-ray detectors sitting up above the atmosphere now see these on a pretty regular basis. Um, and I'll just, uh, I think I've said all these things before. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is just kind of for your notes. Uh, one active region can produce literally dozens of flares as it, as it crosses, transits the sun. Um, active region lifetimes can be days, weeks, in some cases months, maybe a couple, three rotations around the sun. Okay. You've already gotten a little bit of experience with how, in the homework set, with how we classify these. In, we have two bands of detector bands on the GOES satellites. By the way, these measurements are being made from the GOES satellites that you might recognize as giving you the big picture view of the weather down at the surface of the Earth. So they have upward and outward looking detectors that are for space environment modeling. And here's a flare that, uh, what, it didn't quite, it hit maybe M8 or M9. We always make the measurements of our flares for classification purposes with this red line here, which is the soft x-rays. The hard x-rays are getting more into the, the gamma uh, regime. OK, so that's in the 0.1 to 0.8 nanometer band. Uh, and uh, we can you know, figure out how much energy for how long and, and, and get an estimate just in that band. But of course, there are lots of other bands that we're not looking at. So um, these are broken down into categories. Uh, so these are decadal in nature. So a peak energy flux of 5.7 uh, times 10 to the minus 2 ergs per centimeter squared is 10 to the minus 5th watts per meter squared per second, or uh, joules, if you like. Uh, and that would be essentially, with that 5 there being the n exponent, that's an M class flare. People go, how did you come up with these names? Well, X is for extreme, M is for moderate. I can't spell moderate. That should be an A. C is for common. I, I, these two are true. That's mostly true. B is for background, and A is for eh. OK. Hard and soft. So, so these, uh, these are essentially the gamma rays. And the, they're, they're clearly a much lower by almost two orders of magnitude flux. So we, we actually pay a lot of attention to the, rel to the ratio of these. If we see that they're coming into alignment within a decade or half a decade, then we know that that was a very energetic flare that drove a lot of electrons down deep into the atmosphere. But our measurement for our purposes of classifying for effects here on Earth, we stick with the red curve, which is the lower energy curve, but more photons coming out. OK? How do we see that over the course of the solar cycle? I updated this from what I put on the, on the, uh, on the web. So here's solar cycle 23, and I think, what do we have? Here's the common class flare, their distribution for solar cycle 23 and 24. The X are down here in red. You can see there are many fewer of them. And this is from a, a website where uh, they built a detector that um, you know, even high schoolers can build. And they've got a different, so they've got a different kind of detector. And they're just showing from the ground basically what they're able to, uh, to see. So they're, um, uh, I think that is pretty Probably that is a radio detector is what they're using because obviously that signal's not getting to the ground. Okay, so how are flares related to coronal mass ejections? Remember, I said that that magnetic field, as it got closer together, the reason it would get closer together is because there's this shearing motion. So here we're going to shear these things that I'll call magnetic arcades. They're going to appear in a whole line like this. And as it shears and the energy starts to propagate away, it's almost like a, a domino type of effect 
where you essentially break that whole thing apart and you form these large coils called a flux rope, a magnetic flux rope, and it's the thing that's going to lift off out into interplanetary space. So before I just showed you kind of the two-dimensional cartoon, what we actually see is that these things come rolling out past Earth. What's kind of interesting is that, that plasma is cool, relatively cool and dense, and we don't image it very well. What we do get to image is back down on these places where, where we've now closed the field off again, and the particles become trapped, but they're heated. We can actually look down from the top here and see, uh, this is called the glow worm uh, f flare, because looking at it from Earth, we could see the tops of these arcades with uh, the hot plasma trapped in, um, in the magnetic field lines, and it looks like a huge, long glowworm across, across the, the region. It was probably, I think this is the 2000, July 2000 event, and we can see it. We can see the plasma starting to, to heat up, and pretty soon you see this incredible view of, of the looking down on the tops of these, uh, of these arches. If you can look down on the tops of those arches and see that, then you know that something has gotten loose into interplanetary space. The question is, how big, how fast, and what's its orientation? We are not very good at forecasting that. There are other slight configurations many variations on the theme. Sometimes a flare over here will not just inject inner uh, electrons back down along its field lines, but will have some access to somebody else's field lines, so to speak. And so sometimes you get very mixed signals in terms of, of what that flare is going to look like. But what is amazing to me is that, that this would be the side view if you were looking down on the glowworm uh, flare, you would be essentially looking down on the top of that. That the sun can actually trap these th this plasma, and it is the trapped plasma circulating around these field lines that gives you these beautiful images of what the field lines look like. There aren't any wires there. They're just force fields. So these accelerated electrons are heating up the thermal plasma in the loop and also driving particles down, and uh, that essentially uh, creates even more emission that we see in the hard X-ray. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's, just kind of for your notes, the sequence of things that happen. We shear, differentially rotate, use the, con the ability of the convection to twist up the magnetic field, get that magnetic field oppositely directed to come together. The field annihilates, it frees up energy in the form of photons and accelerated particles. Soft x-rays, 1 to 10 keV, 3 keV is kind of the norm. Uh, hard x-rays, much, much hotter. Manuel? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So are those uh, arches, uh, the lines of magnetic field? Mm -hmm. So how can charged particles follow the lines of magnetic field? Because usually the force is orthogonal to the lines, right? They're trapped. Well, the force is orthogonal. So they're doing like this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so what you are seeing is essentially a ensemble view of billions of electrons making that, uh, making that motion. And that motion means that there are charged particles uh, changing direction, and they have to emit. The force moving the, the, the particles forward is not magnetical, it's just thermal, oh, right? Th th that's thermal. Okay. So, so it's thermal. It's but thermal what, and magnetic. Yes. Yeah, and, and now what's going to happen is these are essentially caught in what we're going to call a magnetic bottle. If the field down here is stronger than the field up here, then they're going to go down, for reasons that we will get into a little bit later in the class, they will go down to a certain point, feel where the field line is strong, and get essentially repelled. And so these, field, these particles are bouncing back and forth as they're gyrating. That's why they have the longevity to make the light that we, that we measure. Um, 
Okay, I just wanted to, to point out to you that, as I've already done in the, in the talk that I gave, sort of the presentation from yesterday, is that we don't just see this in the um, particles uh, in the x-ray. We actually get to see this kind of uh, bursts of electromagnetic energy coming out across a very large portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. So thermoplasma, as you asked about, and accelerated electrons. Both are involved. So how might that work? Well, there's one part of this. The thermoplasma is actually something called Bremster lung radiation. It's coming from these kind of low energy ions. So here's an accelerated electron. It meets up with uh, or goes by, attempts to go by a proton somewhere in the atmosphere. And it says, oh, look, you know, I should, I should head that direction. It has so much energy that it's going to skip right by. But the fact that it changes its trajectory means it changes its direction. And a charged particle whose direction changes means it's accelerated, it's going to emit radiation. And so for these pretty, for these thermal particles, they're actually emitting X-ray photons simply because they see, you know, somebody that they're attracted to, but they're moving too fast to, to actually be grabbed by it. And so we see all of this Bremsstrahlung radiation coming out from just this general thermal motion. Um, Okay, why do we get that? Remember I sh at the very beginning I showed you kind of a, a ribbon? It looked like there were kind of two little footprints. What happens is those ribbons are field lines or patches of field lines that have dimensions in and out of the board here. And essentially those particles are bouncing or crashing into those regions. And so... What we get out of that is if we look down on one of these, this is that extended region where we've got the arches above and particles are crashing down. And because they are arches whose feet extend some distance apart down into the solar atmosphere, you, actually, you see in many cases, you see the flares come out as ribbons of light rather than just points of light. When you get a, no, uh, a notice, if you, you know, subscribe to the Space Weather Prediction website, that there has been a two-ribbon flare, that's pretty good indication that you've gotten a very big part of the atmosphere involved in one of these flare CME combinations, and that the particles in the trap field lines are crashing down into the upper atmosphere. Sometimes there's enough of them with enough energies to actually make energy in the white light continuum. We call that a white light flare, and that's kind of a big deal. 60 keV electrons or more involved in that process. So we know that there's actually a, uh, there's a relationship. If we see hard x-ray, so that's that blue line that I said, oh, you know, that's where we're getting the um, uh, gamma rays coming out. Whenever we have white light flares that we see in those uh, ribbons, we also get a very strong correlation with the hard x-ray. So that just confirms that, yes, that's what, well, it doesn't confirm it. It gives a strong uh, sense that those two are tied together, that those very energetic hard x-rays are also in the place where you're producing enough energy to uh, produce a white light continuum. Yeah. I'm having trouble uh, with the electrons moving down. Is that after they rise in the atmosphere? So here's the, here's the place where we have <clears throat> annihilated the energy. That would have been our yellow bar region before. So what happens is that is the source for the energy that makes those particles. It does, in fact, uh, uh, drive them across field lines. And then once they get into those field lines, then they're going to bounce and turn back and forth. So is, is that what you were asking? 
about. Yeah. Yeah, so, so these particles left to their own devices would just hang out up here in this upper loop. But if you're going to drive them down, you actually have to make them go across field lines. But they like the field lines that they were on, so you have to give them a lot of energy to push them and convince them to go to other stronger field lines. And then once they're there, they probably have enough thermal energy to just kind of um, get caught up in, this, in the system. And they absorb that energy from... Uh, th that is from changing uh, magnetic energy, which is, we'll come to that probably in the next homework set. How much energy is associated with a magnetic field that annihilates? Um, it, it turns out to be a factor of B squared. So if you have a strong magnetic field and it annihilates, then that's B squared energy essentially going out. And it can go out into either directed motion or thermal motion. And, and it can go out into, into light as, as well. So it, you actually do create photons, just pure photons out of this. OK. Um, relation to the coronal mass ejections? Well, we've already kind of seen this. Uh, this is the diagram from before. This is kind of the standard model where we've, here's the region, the yellow bar region, x-ray loops. Plasmoid may be containing some relatively cool material from the upper atmosphere that was just hung up there being shot out. Here's our view from above the ecliptic plane. Earth is here. So this structure right here becomes a magnetic loop. Still probably attached to the sun. Most of them still are attached to the sun even after they reach Earth. It's kind of amazing. You can stretch out this magnetic field line and have it go all the way back to the Earth. And the reason that we know that is because just as down here where we have particles going back and forth, in space we can measure the electrons and their energy and we actually see counter-streaming electrons. We see electrons on those field lines coming at us from different directions, headed back to the sun or close to the sun. They'll stop where the magnetic field gets really strong compared to their energy and then bounce the other direction. So the thing that's going on here is also going on here in three dimensions. So if we see these coils of magnetic field that contain these electrons bouncing to and fro, uh, then we know, oh yeah, we're in, a, we're in one of these ejecta from the sun. So to kind of go back from that, those coils are being made where we have the shear foot points of those magnetic fields on the sun. They're shearing to the point that we're bringing magnetic fields together, annihilating, and here's that coil that is going to blow out. By the time those things reach past Earth, they can be a quarter of an AU wide. They're taking up a quarter of the distance between sun and Earth. They have just literally blown out, which tells you that magnetic fields want to expand. The, uh, going past Earth, uh, hours to maybe a day and a half for this structure to go past Earth. If it's coming out fast, it's going to have a shock ahead of it with all kinds of turbulent field kind of in front of it. Now, you might wonder how often do these things happen? There's a solar cycle dependence. Okay, that probably doesn't surprise you because we know the sun is more active during solar maximum. And so here we have a look back at solar cycle 23. Um, during solar minimum, we maybe get kind of, uh, from what we, our vantage point, we can see maybe half of a CME a day. Solar max, we might get five to eight CMEs popping off of the sun. If we want to, uh, we can look at them. Here's the black line is essentially the sunspot numbers. And the blue line is the number of CMEs that we can count by just human eye, which isn't very reliable. But it does look a lot like the sunspot cycle. So it says, yeah, those sunspots must be at the root of this. But if you, if you develop an automatic regime where you're not biased to look at the big events, what we see is we still see the same thing. It's just that we see a lot more 
of these CMEs coming out. So we're pretty much going the route of, of, of you know, um, automated detection so that we can get, hold, get a hold of the numbers of these. They have some interesting latitude distributions. So during solar minimum, most of them come out near the equator. Okay, that's where we still have most of the closed field lines for regions that we'll talk about later. And so these regions here shown bright are where we're probably going to get these coiled field lines coming off. As we go to solar maximum, we have these active regions redistributed all over the sun. And so we will get CMEs coming off from a wide range of latitudes. Okay, and uh, this is, uh, car well, it's a cartoon view. It's actually a model view of what these things look like once they get out into interplanetary space. And they have magnetic field orientations that if, they po if the magnetic field coming from this mass ejecta points opposite the direction of the magnetic field at the nose of Earth's magnetosphere, then that's an opportunity for these systems to link up in a new reconnection opportunity, and the energy at that reconnection point then then become energy for Earth's system. And we will spend a good part of the class kind of looking at that. Now, I want to see here something isn't quite looking the way I thought it should. Must have. Oh, here's where I want to go. If these CMEs are coming out very, very fast, then they're also going to interact with the much more tenuous material that is out in the interplanetary medium. And they will excite those individual protons. These are particles uh, measured by the GOES satellite uh, and uh, start to excite them uh, and energize them. And so we actually watch for situations where we have CMEs or even not coming out. And we measure particles with different energies also on the GOES spacecraft. Uh, and so here's an event where, let's see, 2011, November, 3rd, November 2nd, November 3rd, really not much going on. And then all of a sudden, we start to see sort of order of magnitude increase in the number of particles. Now, the number of particles that we're talking about here are not huge. Particles per centimeter squared per second per stair radian. So centimeter squared, that's your thumbnail. Okay. And so we're going to look at, ah, uh, Oh my gosh, we've got one. Or the warning criteria is if we have 10 of them coming from essentially we're going to have a detector that's sort of looking at two pi stair radians it's looking out. Uh, but we're going to figure, you know, measure those. And you go, well, that doesn't seem like very much. That's not very exciting. But those particles have a lot of energy. The individual particles, not many of them, but a lot of energy. These are the particles that actually hit the solar arrays of spacecraft and have enough energy to get in and rearrange part of the lattice structure of the solar arrays. And that starts to make those um, solar arrays less efficient if you're moving individual uh, silicone atoms around. And so uh, these 1 to 10 MeV particles are a real nuisance for solar arrays. As you get more and more energetic, then they become real nuisances for humans and for other types of detectors in spacecraft. So we monitor, uh, we monitor this. This is what it can look like for a really big event. Uh, this was January of 2014, so what, about three years ago? Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, we're sitting around minding our own business and everything even the 60 MeV electrons, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 100 MeV electrons uh, go up. 30 MeVs start to get partway into an astronaut's um, spacesuit. You know, actually may come in contact with, some fraction of them will come in contact with 
with, uh, with skin if the astronaut is not protected in some other way. So it gives you kind of a sense for what energies. 100 MeV, you just do not want to mess around with those guys. They are, they're coming after you. How does that happen? Well, here is a CME blowing out. It's one that's not clearly Earth-directed. Actually, it does have a component. Notice how all of a sudden you start seeing this, all of these white traces. It kind of looks like snow. There are some of these images that are just completely obliterated, a snowstorm in space. What that, what that is, those are, the, those are those energetic particles interacting with this telescope tube of the instrument that's making this measurement, creating stray bits of light by interacting with the particles, and then those stray bits of light get recorded as a signal. Now, if you're trying to use a star tracker during this kind of event, it's a little messy. Well, it's a lot messy. Okay, star trackers don't work very well during uh, major events like this. So. We certainly, and star trackers, you know, once you get into that 50 to 100 MeV range, then they're uh, subject to, uh, you know, being in a bad state. So just to, to kind of summarize again, fast CMEs are the ones that are changing the magnetic field with respect to these relatively stationary protons in interplanetary space. They're just the sun's cool atmosphere that has expanded out. Uh, and, but here comes a changing magnetic field at these guys, rattling the field lines that they're already on, and that starts to accelerate them. And as a result, uh, you, that, that event that created that glowworm uh, flare was also an event that essentially blinded sensors in July of 2000. That was a CME at Central Meridian that came straight at us at very high speeds created that beautiful glowworm uh, flare and made just a wreck of um, trying to do any kind of star tracking. What's particularly interesting is we don't understand these SEP events very well. They are real um, tough things. One of the reasons that we think we don't understand them so well is that the particles if there is a previous CME that has come out, those particles can bounce between those two structures in the, in the heliosphere and re-excite each other. And so sometimes you don't know if they're coming at you from what direction because they can actually uh, interact with other structures in the solar wind. So if we have multiple fast CMEs in the vicinity of Earth, that can be a precursor for some very severe events, the May 67 event was one of those. We had multiple CMEs coming out. I didn't point it out, but there were actually, where I said there was one flare, there were actually three, meaning that there were probably three CMEs that got loose into the system, and that system continued to produce CMEs, so it continued to produce energetic particles. And kind of the um, two final Thoughts on this? Are CMEs and SEPs related? So yes, they are. If we look at how much energy is associated with um, the flare component and how much energy is associated with the CME, so what we see is there's, uh, again, uh, this is a um, power law situation, but there's a pretty nice association between how much energy is coming out of that flare acceleration and how much is coming out of the CME acceleration. Now, these are kind of rare events. They are they're not detected all that often. We get CMEs all the time. We get x-rays all the time. But now we're starting to talk about sort of a maximum of a dozen. These are rare events. But guess what? The biggest events that produce the flares, the CMEs, and the particles. Those are the fastest, and they tend to be right along central meridian or maybe a little bit to the west for reasons that we'll talk about. So CMEs, like I said, one every day or maybe several times a day. Not all of them hit Earth, but when we get these big proton events, there aren't so many of them, but they're really broad in longitude. They, they're going to hit us.
Um, we will finish off right here with just a, a diagram that I wanted to have in your, in your records that kind of shows you how much energy, what's the energy budget look like for these? How much magnetic energy is available? 10 to the 33rd erg, subtract 7, we'll call that 10 to the 26th joules, and then log scale, but here's where it goes. 5, 10% to the solar energetic particles, about half to the kinetic energy of these big loops, and then 45% kind of spread across the various energy ranges that make, that make the flare. So this is uh, one of the few times that I've actually found something that shows an energy budget, so I wanted to have that. We'll use that for future reference and some homework problems. Okay. We have survived episodic solar emissions in 45 minutes. I'll remind you that there is a time scale associated with that. You've seen this before, but I'll keep that in your notes as well. And so now you kind of have a very big picture view of rates and timing and names of structures that make um, the space environment a very interesting place to to work. So um, I think we'll let the weekend play out, um, and I will endeavor to write a new homework set for you while you endeavor to finish up the homework set that you're going to hand in by 10.30 a.m. tomorrow morning. Okay? All right, so I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>